Now Robert is known as Rob Bob Fenton and while I'm reading it from this just to get the word in correct, which is the National Environment Centre from the River in the Tape. But Rob's worked with us for four or five years now. Uh, not only doing this sort of work, he's developed uh, courses for the organic I don't know. <laughs> yes? I was just asking if I could also um, speak back with the relocalisation of the Five dollars a minute, drop it in a tin on the way out the door and you're right. <laughs> no worries. You remind me please, will you? Because otherwise I may forget. Robert Fenton, as I said, is from the uh, TAFE. We've worked together for about four or five years. and. While I know a lot about Rob, it would be a shame for me to tell you what he's done with regard to the, the uh, organic courses and what you can achieve there. But today, you'll, what you can tell us briefly about, I guess you're talking about the success of the farm, right? Yeah, eh? that's correct. The same as you did for... Same as the last one. That was great. Yep. Do it again. Okay, thanks, Dave. I'll get out of your way. Thank you. <clears throat> this is where I come from. Uh, the National Environment Centre is just a specialist TAFE campus near Albury, Wodonga, uh, just over the Murray River. Uh, we're a specialist TAFE campus because we focus, as our name says, on environmental type courses and one of our main focuses is organic farming and that's uh, why I'm here today and why we've done work with BFA for the last few years. We run, we have students all over Australia doing courses with us in organic farming. Uh, part of our campus though, um, this is our main campus building, uh, but that's almost fair in the middle of a 400 acre uh, OCA certified organic farm and uh, we set up this farm and designed this farm back in the, in the 1990s, 1997 ish uh, with some certain things in mind. We knew we wanted it to be certified organic but we also knew there was a lot of stuff we didn't know. Um, we didn't know which way our climate was going to go, we still don't. We didn't know which way um, uh, energy was going to go in terms of how much it was going to cost, what, um, how easy it was to get, what sort of energy would be available. We didn't know that either. And we didn't know about fertilisers as well, what would be available, how much would it cost. So we had all these uncertainties. And so we started a process of designing this farm system, this 500 acre organic farm system, with a whole lot of uncertainties, like all of us do. And um, so what we did is we actually started to design tools for designing farm systems in uncertainty. And that's what I'd like to talk about today, is some of the design tools we've used on this farm, we're going to look at it in a sec, and some of the practical applications that have worked for us up in the Riverina around Albury. Um, so um, that's what I'm going to talk about. How, how much time have I got, Dave? How much time have I got? Depends how we're feeling. Yeah. Watch us if we're holding off. Yeah, right. <laughs> no, I'd say you've got a good half hour. Half hour, right. Yep. Does that suit you? That's fine. Yep. There we go. <clears throat> this is the Seven Mile Creek, uh, uh, which runs through um, the uh, northern end of our, our organic farm. Uh, it hasn't looked like that for about a decade. Um, uh, back then there were platypus and um, blackfish and things like that in the creek. Uh, there's no platypus and blackfish in there anymore. Uh, but we're still quite proud of our Seven Mile Creek and, uh, and, and carefully protect it. Uh, as we um, go, went through this process of um, developing this farm based on uncertainty, the uncertainty whacked us between the eyes. And um, I guess it's happened in Dalesford as well, but um, the last 10 years for us have been um, uh, horrific in terms of uh, rainfall and changes in the patterns and all that sort of stuff. Do I have to... There we go. Uh, to explain a little bit about the landscape of the farm before we really get into it, uh, this is a... Uh, all the um, drainage lines in the farm are wetlands and creeks like that seven mile creek we saw a minute ago. Then we've got 
uh, slopes running up, as you can see, running up back behind that dam there. Uh, and then hilltops, fairly similar type of rolling country like we're, we're looking at out the window there, but all the hilltops are treed. And so most of the, um, most of the uh, areas that we use as productive land are the slopes running between the drainage lines and the hills. And that suits the soil types. We've got hilltop soils and our slope soils and then our drainage line soils are really heavily leached uh, and uh, not suitable for most production. Here's looking at um, the landscape from a slightly di different direction and there's clouds there. I can't remember when I took that photo, but it was a while ago I think. But um, you can see that um, up on the hills up there, on the, on the, as you look at on the right hand side, we've got a tree system. And then on the slopes, we've got this grazing land running down to the drainage lines down below. Now, um, you, you can see uh, in between the, uh, the fence there and the tall trees, that's uh, a small part of an olive orchard uh, based on gathering water from swales. Um, we grow olives. Uh, our main production is uh, organic lamb that we sell at the local farmers markets. Uh, we grow a bit of garlic. Um, occasionally, uh, not this year, but occasionally we do barley grubs and um, a few other things as well. Uh, and we're about to start um, pasture-based egg production too. But at the, for the last 10 years, the mainstay of the farm has been organic lamb production for local farmers markets. And the, the lamb production is occurring on these slope soils that are most suitable for uh, that type of thing. The body cub production, our honey production that we do as well, uh, and, and the other things are happening in the trees, in the trees on the hills and down on the, down on the creeks on the, on the drainage lines. Our first uh, and probably the most important um, designing in uncertainty uh, tool we came up with is we call one star, three star, five star energy. And we said one star energy is anything we're using diesel or electricity or something like that, industrial energy. We were uncertain about what the future was for that. We still are. We know it's going to get dearer and harder to get. And so all our systems have been designed to minimise the amount of industrial energy. Three star energy is the energy that um, I would use if I went down the paddock with my hoe chipping weeds or something like that. It's cultural energy, it's human physical work. And uh, I've had enough of that, so we try to minimise that as well. And five star energy is the energy uh, that we get from designing an ecosystem on the farm. So five star energy is the energy that we design into the farm system. Here's an example of using that tool. This is an oak crop. Um, Seeing we don't get any autumn breaks anymore up there, uh, we use an oak crop for a bit of grazing through the winter and then we fatten some of our summer, late summer lambs on the grain that falls to the ground. But you use one star energy to put an oak crop in. We have to start the tractor and use diesel. That's breaking one of our rules. But this oak crop, this one here you're seeing, this photo was taken two years ago, this is its seventh year of the same sowing. And so what we've done is we sow it once. Now either we broadcast it out out of the back of the four wheel mic, you know, um, out of a fertiliser spreader and then run the sheep over the top to, to bury it or we direct drill it with our direct driller and then we graze it through the winter, let the seed fall to the ground in the, in the standing straw <coughs> and then we, we uh, graze the lambs through that straw through the summer until there's the right density of seed left on the ground again. We crash the we crash the, um, the straw down over the top to stop the cockatoos and the galahs eating the rest of the grain and the crop comes up again next year. And uh, so this is the seventh year of, of that crop. So we've really reduced the amount of one star energy in that but still generating a certain amount of feed for our sheep. So all the way through these uh, slides I'm going to show you now, there'll be examples of this one star, three star, five star design tool to try and minimise our inputs that way. I'm having real trouble making this work, I tell you. Uh, another one of our design tools, and uh, it's become more important to us over time, is we, what we call slow the water down. Uh, uh, we have a, a landscape like we can see out the window there, 
Uh, we used to get around about 750 millimetres of rainfall a year. Uh, who knows what we get now? And what we're trying to do is maximise the amount of time the water that falls on our farm spends there before it moves off. We're not actually uh, trying to gather in the, in the dams or anything like that. We're trying to store it and slow it down in other ways. Uh, and uh, a lot of our effort goes into slowing that water down. This is one example. Can you see the green phalaris on top of the little bank there? In the front? Just here, I'll get out of the way so everyone can see that a bit. Uh, that's a leaky dam. Now on each of our drainage lines, through the farm, and there's a number of them, we've set up these little leaky dams. They're, they're dams we've built, the walls are only that high. Now, anyone that's built a dam before will know that usually what you do is when you're about to build a bank, you key it in. You basically build, you cut down into the clay underneath and build the, build the wall from underneath the ground and then up. So there's nowhere for the water to leak. We built these dams fair on top of the ground. In fact, we didn't even clear the vegetation off. So what that means is if we get a rain event, then the water, when it does get to the drainage line, puddles behind these leaky dams, uh, and then over the next two or three weeks, slowly sleep, sneaks down underneath and moves down to the next one. And so instead of our rainfall going, falling on the ground and gone off our farm within 10 or 15 minutes normally, it'll spend a month or so there before it moves on. And uh, there's a whole series of these leaky dams moving down that line there. Uh, there's, a, there's other strategies you can use as well. Um, and uh, Peter Andrews, uh, which a lot of people are familiar with, uses other strategies doing the same thing. But uh, we can't grow the same amount of organic matter that Peter Andrews does, so we use a slightly different technique. Leaky dams. We've probably got 30 or 40 of those little structures through the drainage lines on the farm now. And uh, it's remarkable to watch them working, they're fantastic. So, oh. so what happens are uh, the drainage line's coming down here yeah. and so the, uh, the water comes down this drainage line and sits behind that bank there. Yeah. And then it slowly leaks, instead of running off straight away, it slowly leaks under the dam wall yeah. or under that thing and moves down the slope, broadly down the slope really slowly over time. You're about more pasture, yeah, about more, pasture. more pasture or more habitat. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, and um, and uh, and um, more growth in everything. You can see some of this is phalaris pasture, some of it further down are tree systems doing the same thing. Yeah. Less erosion. Sorry. Less erosion. Less erosion too. Yeah. Uh, and um, it makes our creeks behave. If we went back to that picture of the Seven Mile Creek that we looked at before. Now with. Um, our grazing area around um, where we are, it's all grassland, pretty much like here. Uh, grassland makes water go like that. You get a rain event, whoosh, the water's gone. Where woodlands and tree systems, as this used to be, let the water go slowly. And so we're trying to let the water go slowly off the farm and spread out. So what it means is that even our creeks down below aren't being flooded and, and eroded as well, and they've got water in them for longer. Yeah. So there's a whole lot of benefits of that. Uh, the other, one of the other ways we use to slow the water down is key line pattern ploughing. Uh, here's a, a paddock uh, just before it was planted with some garlic um, uh, being pattern ploughed. You can see the, we use a single time uh, small ripper. We've got really, really poor soils where we are. So our, pattern, our deep ripping pattern ploughing is about that about, about deep. Uh, but that's, that's what's happening there. So, do I need to explain that? Does everyone understand pattern ploughing? Maybe I should. Uh, the idea with pattern ploughing, it's like contour ripping, except the way you do it, it means that the water ends up running out onto the ridges from the, the drier areas, so it spreads the water evenly across the landscape. So if we had a leaky dam leaking water up here, and the water flows down out of that, then it's these pattern ploughing spreads that water all the way across that paddock, evenly across the paddock, rather than allow it concentrating into the drainage lines in the paddock, so more even water. Also, that allows that the pattern ploughing allows the water 
to infiltrate into our terrible soils. Um, I should, should probably explain that. Uh, the Guna soils are very, very acid, about 4.2 pH in calcium chloride, uh, low in everything but aluminium and a couple of other nasties and, um, and uh, highly dispersible subsoil clays and you think of a problem you could have with soil and uh, we've pretty much got it. And, uh, and so we have to be really, really careful with how we manage our, our soils. So you can, you can see uh, again there the landscape with the, the trees on the hilltops, the grazing productive areas, managing and slowing the water down on the slopes and then the carefully managed uh, drainage lines down below. I, I, um, I feel like um, I'm teaching my grandmother to suck eggs when I talk about some of it, this sort of stuff, but it's um, uh, just as important as any of those other little tricks in slowing the water down is maintaining ground cover. And uh, we actively monitor our ground cover in all our paddocks. Uh, it's been harder and harder over time to do that. Uh, but this is about as low a ground cover as we'd hope to find, although the, uh, late this summer um, it's as bad as we've ever had it. I don't know if it's the same down around Darlesford and everywhere, but our summer uh, was um, was unbelievable. Um, those three hot weeks when you guys had the fires down around here and all that sort of stuff, uh, all our all our surface organic matter just disappeared. Just it was all gone. So um, uh, we um, we we monitor that carefully and manage the organic matter, and that really slows the water down as well. Any, any questions on that? By um, the most important part of this slowing the water down is then once you slow it down is to be able to hang on to it so that your food production, production system can use it. And um, we all know that that means increasing soil organic matter. Uh, we use just a really rough rule of thumb up there uh, uh, we constantly tell ourselves that for each 1% uh, carbon we can put in the soil, we can hold another inch of rainfall. So if we can slow it down, allow it to penetrate, and then have more organic matter in there to store it, then we may not get 750 metres of rain, millimetres of rainfall anymore, but we've probably got more effective rainfall than we used to. Uh, so we spend a, a lot of time as well, like all organic farmers do, managing the soil ecosystem and managing the carbon in the soil. Our most uh, uh, efficient way of doing that in terms of our one star, three star, five star energy bit is by using uh, uh, cell grazing. And so we'll see in a while, we'll see a farm map in a while. We have about 70 paddocks on that 400 acres. Our sheep uh, get motion sickness moving around that quickly. Uh, but what that does is a, as we all know, if you've got the more green you've got on top, the more roots, the more brown you've got underneath. And then so if we can have a, the longer the rotation between when the sheep come back and eat the grass, the more root material we've got underneath that dies back and we just add to our organic matter. So when we first got to this farm in 1997, the typical soil carbon was about 0.5%. You know, 0.7% organic matter. Now we're seven, eight, nine percent organic matter, four or five percent carbon in the soils from nothing else but careful grazing and stretching out the rotations. Uh, our favourite plant for doing that, by the way, is Patterson's Curse. Uh, it does a fantastic job at getting organic matter in the ground. You think about the, um, the strong tap root. Uh, as our soils have improved, it's become less important, but when we first got there, we had a um, fairly uh, compacted layer only about that far down. Couldn't, we couldn't use our one star, three, we couldn't use the tractor and the deep ripper that much because of the one star energy. But whereas everything else was being stopped by that uh, hard pan, the Patterson's Curse was going straight bloody through. And we were ending up breaking up that hard pan and getting organic matter under that hard pan just because the Patterson's Curse was there. How did you get rid of it after that? Oh, we still got it. <laughs> but Patterson's Curse, the ecology of Patterson's Curse is a pioneer plant and it goes back to that picture before with the soil, with the ground cover. We know we've made a mistake in our paddock if Patterson's Curse comes up and um, 
by crikey we've got it this year. Uh, these two ladies visited here us a while ago and um, I think we were covered in Patterson's Curse then, weren't we? Mm -hmm. Because of what happened in those three days in January, three weeks in January, all that was gone. Uh, that's what I reckon too. But when it becomes dominant, then it's a problem because we're trying to have a great diversity of things in the paddock. Uh, but we know, it's telling us that we did, a, we did a bad thing, we made a blue. We let the ground go bare, the yeah, Patterson's curse. And it'll take us a couple of years to change that dominance back to something else. Patterson's curse, you don't need to spray it, just change the dominance of it. So this is a, a, a fairly typical of our slope soil with about 4% about carbon in it. And probably half of that 4% is due to Patterson's curse. Yeah, I'm oh, sorry. But I've done studies with Lucerne because I can't help but think Lucerne and Patterson first have a lot in common. Oh, yeah. Uh, I wish we could. Our aluminium uh, mm -hmm. is so high and our pH is so low that the numbers don't really stack up for Lucerne. So we can't. Sorry? That's a possibility, yeah, and that's what we're looking at. Yeah, some of the uh, plantain weeds, you know, the flatweed and stuff like that, uh, they are some of our most important plants in the system. Yeah. We don't tend to sow pastures, we tend to let grow what, what grows and use that. Again, five star energy rather than one star energy. Mm. That's right. Yeah. So the uh, if you, the more root mass you can get that actually dies off, that's feed for the microorganisms in the soil. And why is it dying off? It well, in the case, off? well, either <coughs> you crash graze it, oh, okay. or in the in the case of Patterson's curse, it's an annual. Mm. So, yeah, but crash grazing is the so way. We, back from the soil, the roots are mm. Yeah. So so if you've got a, a large green mass on the top. You've got a large brown mass underneath. When you take that green mass back quickly, you reduce the roots as well. Um, another um, uh, of our design tools uh, was to select um, organisms that do really well over a wide range of um, conditions. We didn't know what our, we, we were taking the approach that we didn't know what our conditions were going to be, so we tried to select things that would do well. Plus a range of conditions. I'll explain that a bit more in a minute. But these are some of our sheep. These are uh, Damara sheep, um, and uh, you can see that they're on a um, on a one of our grazing paddocks on the slope uh, with uh, a swale underneath them, managing the water for the for the uh, right now. Um, this, believe it or not, this is a, a graph, uh, but uh, it's, a, it's a, an attempt to try and explain what I'm talking about with how we selected what we were actually going to use in our food production system. A lot of agricultural plants, animals, all the things we use are selected really, really carefully to do really, really well under a set of a special set of conditions. That one. But outside those special set of conditions, they're not that flash. In the mindset of saying we don't know what our conditions will be, maybe it's better that instead of going for that, we get things that do that. Maybe not as flash when it's good, but we get a crop either end as well. And so we, we took that approach into it by saying we're going to try and do that with our systems. Now you can do that two ways. You can, you can do that by selecting the plant or the animal of a crop that is able to do that or by having enough diversity within the plant, animal or crop so that it does that. Everyone get what I mean there? Yeah. In the case of our sheep, uh, we selected the Damara African tractile sheep because they do that. We can get 200 millimetres of rainfall, which we did a few years ago, and still sell lambs at the farmer's market and we could get 1.2 millimetres of rainfall and still sell lambs at the farmer's market because of our Damara sheep. We might, if we get the, get the perfect year, we might produce quite as much lamb as we would with say a, a Dorset or a Dorper or something like that, but over the long run, 
we're saying that we're better off having a crop every year. So that's what that's what that means. So there they are, there are our Damara sheep. Uh, African fat-tailed sheep. Now, the other reason we selected them is because there's a lot less one-star energy in Damara sheep than there are in Dorsets. We don't shear them, we don't crutch them, we don't drench them, we don't vaccinate them, we don't do anything. We bring them in and weigh them once a fortnight and that's all we do. So they fitted our one-star, three-star, five-star energy thing as well quite well. Now, because we sell at the farmer's market with our lambs, and we'll talk about that in a little while, uh, our, um, we have to have lambs ready to go every week, 12 months of the year. Any lamb growers here? Yeah? That, that's a challenge to do that. Yeah, and, uh, and but the, so we had to design a system uh, quite different from most other lamb producing systems in order to do that. We know that we make money at the farmer's market if we have a certain carcass weight. If that carcass weight is five kilos lighter, we don't make money at the farmer's market. It's as simple as that. So we have to, across that 12 months of the year, hit a carcass weight with our lambs. Quite a challenge, and yet they do it. We lamb all year round, so the, the rams are in here all year round, and, um, and we're constantly just taking off lambs ready, ready for market because of that. Uh, there, there's quite a few challenges. Yeah, just on that, so you're selling them cut into whatever product you're selling, or you just... No, we, um, we uh, contract to an avatar, then we have our own butcher we contract to, who packs it just like it would be in a supermarket. Um, we receive it on a Friday afternoon, we label it, weigh it, and sell it at the farmer's markets on the Saturday morning. Um, we'll, we'll see a bit more detail about that in a minute. Yeah. How am I going for time, Doug? Oh, I, I don't know. I just, no, no, no. no hurry? Oh, easy. <laughs> yeah. No, I would suggest that you go over. I want to talk and speak with these people about what they see as the problems in the industry, and I take that back and feed yeah. the system and answer questions. So I probably need 15 minutes, so I suppose you can go for another half hour. Yep, sure. That's it, you. Yep. Thank you. I can just speak slower. Yeah. Now, within that, um, within that system with our dameras, because we, we're trying to reduce the input, because we're certified organic, uh, we uh, work on the, on the system like all organic farmers do, is that we're not dealing with trying to put out bushfires of ill health, we're trying to create health. And so uh, our, our whole farm system is, is put together to create health in our sheep. Healthy soils, healthy plants, healthy sheep, healthy people, all the organic farming stuff. But some of the other things we do to help create health there is that uh, uh, we, uh, we really work hard to try and reduce the stress on the animals. Any kind of stress at all, uh, we reckon is a challenge to their health. You know, I know when I get uh, too stressed and tired, if Doug's gonna make me talk for another half an hour, I'll probably get the flu tomorrow, you know? So uh, we try and keep our sheep happy and stress-free all the time, trying to create health. One of the ways we do that, and I haven't got a slide, slide of this today, uh, first off, um, uh, most uh, animal producers have times when they have to take the young sheep or the young animals away from the old animals, weaners. Um, I can just imagine uh, what it'd be like if uh, all of us here that have got teenage children took them away and put them somewhere by themselves and left them alone. I've got two teenage kids in Dalesford at the moment. I hate to think what's happening. I haven't seen any smoke come up yet, but <laughs> I hate to think what's happening now. Uh, those animals are under terrific stress as weaners. So we have grannies uh, that go with the weaners. We try and have mixed age mobs all the time. So there's older sheep teaching the younger sheep what to do. Uh, and it seems to work really, really well. You don't, uh, you know how weaners are sometimes harder to handles and stuff like that, that never happens. 
because the <coughs> grannies are there to show them what to do. Um, we also um, realise that um, sometimes it might be boring in the paddocks and if we've got boring paddocks we've put something in there for the sheep to play on. Uh, and uh, I'm sheep. I'm <laughs> sheep. <laughs> sometimes it's a leaky dam, you know anyone that's got sheep knows how or goats how they play. So we try not to have boring paddocks as well and 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 work towards creating the health. So we uh, we don't get any ill health at all. We had a dead sheep on Saturday, and that's the first one we've had for 18 months. Uh, and we've had, we, we haven't had any that we've needed to drench because of worms or anything like that for year after year after year. How do you use those patch holy uh, recipes? We don't, we don't use patch recipe because it doesn't suit our soil. Uh, we've built our own recipe based on our soil tests knowing what's lacking in our system and building it that way and using kelp uh, or, or some seaweed type thing as well because um, some of the micronutrients that animals need don't show up in plant tests uh, and so we shotgun it, we cover all bases with the seaweed based stuff at the same time. Uh, Rob, you're talking about stress in the animals, the ultimate stress is at the abattoir. Do you, do you consider getting on farm slaughter by uh, I wish. Um, it's such a difficult thing to do and I've tried and tried and tried. Uh, we started off trying by um, uh, looking and seeing if we could engage one of those mobile yeah. butchers that travel around the countryside. Uh, there's a number around Albury that are, that are meat inspectors as well. But um, I forget the government department that's in control of that now, but they wouldn't, wouldn't even discuss it. Uh, there, there's so much legislation tied up in the processing of meat, um, and and um, that um, that it becomes that they're basically legislating the small processes out of the industry. I think because of them to to meet compliance. Can you go more creative than that by selling the live animal first, so that it's not on a commercial basis or something to that effect? Oh. Just enough. Gee, just a thought. what a good thought. Yeah, yeah. yeah I like that. Because that's the way they're going with uh, to yeah. get around the raw milk repeat yeah. yeah. You sell it, um, the milk as baby milk, you sell the cream as body cream and stuff mm. like that. So that, that can comply. Yeah. Or shares in the cow. Yes. Yeah, right. yeah. yeah. Uh, so, no, we haven't. And uh, as the small abattoirs disappear, uh, we're required to go to bigger and bigger abattoirs all the time. The sheep are there for longer and longer and there's more and more stress. We used to go to a small family operated abattoir and um, I'd, um, I'd lock the sheep up of an evening. I'd know exactly when they were going to start processing our sheep and turn up right then. So the sheep weren't at the abattoir for longer than 15 minutes before they weren't there anymore, you know. But now, now they're there for hours and hours and hours and, and it's a downer, I know. It's yeah. really bad for the people as well. Yeah, yeah. Question, what size mobs do you have those? We, we have our sheep all in one mob, apart from the weaners. And that's not stressful to them? No. And the, the reason why we have them all in one mob is from a worm control perspective. Uh, when the sheep drops the dung out the back, you've got about four days before the eggs hatch and the worm larvae get up on top of the grass where they become reinfected. And then the population goes up like that and then slowly drops. So the longer you go out before they're back in there, the less worm eggs there are to reinfect back through the system again. We try and make that, that thing steep, that slope steeper by other reasons. So if you have, if you've got one mob and you've got 70 paddocks like we do, it might be 150 days before they get back to that paddock. If you've got two mobs, you immediately cut it in half to 75 if you've got three. Yeah, so the, the, the less mobs you've got in this kind of system, the better it is. Mm. So the weaners, they're not in that mob. No, and, and the weaners go in uh, uh, um, the weaner that are going to market, uh, go into a, a, a clean paddock to go to market. The weaner ewes never leave. We change our ram rather than take the weaner ewes out. Yeah. So as soon as the weaner ewes get to that point where they're, they're ready to start breeding, then there's a new ram in the mob. Um, this is at um, 
the farmers market between Albury and Wodonga. Um, now, one of the other um, uh, design rules that we had when we started putting this farm system together is that constantly we're, we're, we were told by industry that we needed to produce a lamb of a certain carcass weight, of a certain fat depth, etc, etc, etc. All the chops needed to look the same. And unless we did that, then we wouldn't get any money for livestock. Uh, we knew that designing in uncertainty, producing lambs all year round, that was an impossibility. And even if we tried it, it's probably got some environmental negative impacts as well. So being your own retailer means that you can communicate to your customer that the chops are going to be different next week or whatever that food seasonal will change through the year and that we've found that that's a positive rather than a negative that uh, our customers have connected with our food and know that the chops are going to be slightly different there might be a little bit more fat sometimes and they might be a little bit smaller other times and that's a marketing positive for us rather than a negative so there's a so one of the things about designing and uncertainty we found was to to try and do as much of your own retailing as you can we spend more time being uh, retailers than we do being farmers because this farm takes hardly any time at all to, um, to run uh, and we, we might spend a day a week or so actually marketing. It takes much less than a whole day a week to run this farm. So we sell our certified organic lambs, lamb chops at the farmer's market there. Doesn't matter what they are. If we've had a really bad season they want, might be as bad might be as big or if they're a really really good season they might be carrying a little bit more fat around the edge but generally speaking they um, we, we'll still sell them and um, what, I, what I was getting to there I'm, I'm sorry I've lost track for a sec oh yeah um, we then control our whole our whole system so and then we become the price setter rather than the price taker so that's taking an uncertainty out straight away. So on Friday afternoon when the meat comes from the butcher shop back there, we work out how much we need to make per lamb and then price our chops and roasts and everything accordingly to that. So we, we usually work on, on $250 a head for our lambs and then, and then work it back to how much that is for a packet of loin chops. And it's usually only five or 10% higher than what the normal price would be in the supermarket that week. Now, so it cost us about $70 for the transport process. From when the lamb leads the farm down to the abattoir to the butcher shop, packing, and then to here the farmer's market, it cost us $70 a lamb to do that. And, and we get about $250 a lamb gross at the retail. So, uh, and, and we can just set that price. And because it's organic, and because uh, it's at local market and because the local people now know what the product is, it's not price sensitive. Uh, we've tried it once just to see what would happen and we said $300 a head and it made no difference. So now we're not going to do that. Uh, we felt there were some negatives in charging too much so we've gone back to about $250 a head. But it doesn't seem to be price sensitive at all. Another one of the um, design tools. Is everyone starting to get sick of this? No. Yeah? No. And another one of the design tools is to increase the diversity. And uh, this is just a simple example. There's uh, our U mob in one of the paddocks. Again, the slopes running down to the drainage lines. We have an enormous fox problem. We're right on the edge of town, and there's more foxes in Albury than there is out of Albury. Uh, and uh, uh, and um, we used to lose, when we first started, probably 100, 150 lambs a year to foxes. Uh, and so um, we got two alpacas and we don't lose any. Uh, the, the alpacas are fantastic and don't lose any. And it's a five star energy <coughs> way of doing it. Uh, and so now we've got a number of alpacas around the place. There's still a negative here because I think uh, we really care about the, uh, the native animals and plants that are through our farm as well. And I th the foxes are still out there 
you know, leading the anti-kindness and stuff, the alpacas aren't protecting them, so we've still got to deal with that somehow. But what we found was, is that um, uh, being close to town, we use, lose sheep to uh, town dogs as well. 20 or 30 a year probably, sometimes more, sometimes less, and uh, everyone hates that, it's just a terrible thing. Uh, and we found that if you get a serious pack of dogs, usually one that's got a, a sheepdog breed in it, like a Kelpie or something like that, eventually the alpacas break down. They just can't stand it anymore, can't stand the pressure, and, and walk away. So that's why we've got Barbara. <laughs> and uh, Barbara's job is just to... Um, what is Barbara? Barbara's a donkey. <laughs> <laughs> can't you see it too well down there? Um, Barbara, um, Barbara's only job was to um, was to just stop the town dogs eating the sheep, and she has. Uh, uh, she really takes her job to heart, and she hates dogs, and <laughs> does a great job. But Barbara's taken on other responsibilities as well. Uh, we, what is huh? A donkey. donkey. Yeah. <laughs> they are fantastic. Look, no, I don't know. We, um, I, I heard about it from a guy in Montana. I think it was that um, was having trouble with um, cougars or something, coyotes. And so, um, in desperation, we just went and got a donkey. So, oh well, uh, away you go, Barbara. Um, but what she's done as well is, um, you can imagine with seventy paddocks, we're moving them constantly. Barbara's picked up on that, and. Um, uh, for those of you that have moved a mob of sheep before that's got lambs of different age, uh, you can imagine how horrific it can be sometimes. The, the young lambs dragging behind, the older lambs running in front and all that sort of stuff. How many uh, altogether? Sheep? Yeah. Uh, at, at the time this was taken there was probably about 300 ewes. Uh, with lambs of all different ages, heavily pregnant ewes as well and dry ewes. And so the the actual moving the sheep, even on a small 400 acre farm with laneways and everything, could be a chore. Uh, but Barbara fixed that straight away. Because what, what happens, and some, she, we didn't ask her to do it, she just took it on. <laughs> she go and open the gate, she eeyore, 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 marches up to the gate and stands there and all the sheep fall in behind her. And if they dare, if one of the winners dares to go past, the big ears laid back and she chases it and tells off and they all fall in behind and she marches off to the next paddock and stands at the gate until they all come in and then it's then they're right. She's amazing. So uh, that's part of it. Uh, <laughs> she'll probably do a better job. She um she um but but the, the reason I put this slide up was not about Barbara, it was the fact that we try in, uh, in this system have a whole lot of different ways for the one thing to happen. So that instead of relying on one definite way of happening, you have a whole lot of different branches of the system working together so things just happen. And this is just one, one example of that. In the end, after designing all that, we ended up with quite a complex landscape but a, a landscape that um, when you see it in the ground actually makes sense, I think, for, for those of you who've been there, I think. So uh, this is the um, uh, sort of a, a farm plan or the landscape fan, plan of the farm. Only the wide areas are the grazing areas. So it's not much more than half of the farm now, of 400 acres, is actually grazing. Still produces the same amount of lamb, but it's, uh, there's other reasons for that. These are the tree hilltops that we were talking about, producing honey and barley grubs and things like that. These are the, the grazing paddocks producing our organic lamb. And you can see these drainage lines here, <coughs> coming down here, that's, and along the Seven Mile Creek, that green bit there, that's where those leaky dams are, slowing the water down and moving it back out into the farm again. And, uh, and the the, the, the key to the, the way this farm works, again from the one star, three star, five star energy, can you see that? That's a laneway, that red line running around there. That's 220 metres above sea level. It's the highest contour on the farm that covers the whole farm. 
And so if we can get water above that 220 meter um, sea level point, we can take water anywhere on the farm with five star energy. And so that became, that, that line there became the sort of the framework line of designing the landscape of the farm. And um, uh, that's it. Uh, there are a couple of our little lads and some of our students there. That's pretty typical of what mm. it's looked like for the last 10 years or so. Uh, are there any questions? Yeah. Looks like water to me. Yeah. And yet you've gone to a river across it. So tell me about that. Yeah. This is um I haven't got a uh, a photo of that, this at the moment, but that's um a large wetland system mm -hmm. uh, that is used to clean the water up before it gets solar pumped onto that contour and back out for the water for the livestock. So there's about nine wetlands, reed bed wetlands running down through that blue there. And then at the bottom end is the, is the storage dam that gets the clean water. And then it zapped back up above that contour. Yeah. Any yeah. other questions here? I was just wondering how long has the National Environmental Centre been working for? Um, we started this process in the mid 90s. Yeah. yeah. And, um, uh, uh, for just um, we do conservation of land management and other things as well. But from the organic farming perspective, we've got about uh, four, forty or fifty at the moment doing. The, no, no, there are uh, organic farmers all over Australia. We have a um, a um, a uh, distance diploma in organic farming that we worked with Doug and the BFA on a, a number of years ago to get up, which. Uh, is about getting people working towards developing an OMP, an organic management plan for accreditation. And so about 30 at the moment of those students, of those 50 are Queensland, Western Australia, Tasmania, everywhere. And the other 20 are, we run an internship where people come and work on the farm and learn it that way. So there's a group of those and other students as well. Plus Barbara won't accept locals. Yeah, that's yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah. I think the thing you should mention, Rob, is the state of self-funding. I think yes. you mentioned. Yeah, the the TAFE doesn't um, uh, doesn't put any money into the uh, the running of the farm. The farm has to pay its own way. So um, we, have, we have to make money. Wouldn't yeah. be too many other government or semi-government uh, environments that do that. Would it with respect? I mean, here's one that totally funds itself. Yes, someone. Yes, sir. Why did they originally <coughs> select such a marginal farm rather than a you know, high quality farm? Yeah. Is this purely to, to um, from an academic point of view, is to you know, take the most adverse conditions <laughs> and then educate people up through that? Or? Yeah, we were, we, were li we, we were limited. I selected the, the site. Uh, we were limited to an area within the Albury Redonga sort of precinct, you know. But I, we, we, we actively wanted to find one that had significant problems. And so that we could, and then we could work towards still making it productive. Mm. Yeah. Yes. What's your rainfall figures for the last five years? Um, they're like that. Yeah. Um, the lowest is about two thirty, <coughs> and the highest is about six hundred, I think. Historically, seven fifty. Mm. Yeah. Question over here. I just wanted to ask you about inputs. You spend a lot of time getting your carbon levels and everything mm. up. Do you still add things on the annual basis? Fantastic question because um, I, I should have explained that before. At the moment, not because um, uh, we have in the past, but when you look at the one star, three star, five star energy rule that we try really hard to stick to, it really limits to uh, organic local fertilizer. And um, at the moment, uh, that doesn't, it has in the past, but at the moment, it doesn't exist around all we would that. But what's happened, we're, we're cheating the system a bit at the moment because our, as our soils are coming more and more alive, they're actually becoming, even though we know we're dragging the system down a bit at the moment, we're actually, the soils are becoming more and more fertile in terms of the, the farm system. And eventually we'll find something that fits what we want. Yeah. More questions, please? Yes. With um, some of the courses, we're, we're in conversion at Glen Rowan, so very close to you. 
do you run some short courses so that you can put employees through to educate them in organic practices? Oh, we, yeah, yeah, we do. And um, uh, it'd be nice to, um, uh, to, to discuss this with you further because one thing I've got in mind, and we need to talk about this with Doug as well, is organising some way that we can get organic farmers to tap into the traineeship money mm. as well to get, to get keen, passionate workers out on organic farms. And then, because of the, there's not a link being made there at the moment, I don't think. Could you bring that up? Bring yeah. yeah. So, but yes, we do. Um, I've got, I'll leave some cards on the, on the barrel up here and grab one if you want to contact. Yeah. More questions, please? Yeah. Where did you get Barbara from? Oh, just, just local. Just someone gave it to her. Just a town girl. Yeah, <laughs> a, local, a local girl, yeah. Thank you for your advice, Norbert. Gentlemen down the back. With your self sewing oats, you said that the sheep potentially should be easy. No, if we if we don't think the the sheep will only tread it in if there's a fair bit of moisture on the surface. If it's not there, then we break our rule. We'll go for one star energy. Put the direct driller on the tractor and drill it in. But we try not to. You don't get your coffee and dye a different colour to bring them on. No, no, we no, we like our coffees. Yeah. And you said you were flattening the stubble after. Yeah, How if, do you if do that? just roll it. Yeah, we could we could use one step, we could roll it, we could harrow it, or we can move the sheep through it or something like that. All we gotta do is lay it down so the cockies can't find the seed. Other questions please? Can you want to touch on? Oh, you, need, you got another couple of minutes. Couple of minutes? Yeah. All right. Another question. Yeah. What's the, is it a certain board that they come out with? This distance one is a diploma because it's about planning. Um, uh, that we at the moment we're not running a cert for the, the cert for is about practices which is about this traineeship sort of stuff you know but the because our focus is on developing organic management plans and, and robust food systems then we're at the diploma level. Yeah. Uh, I think you mentioned before you were um, thinking about doing eggs. Yeah. Um, yeah. We, uh, we're trying to diversify the farm and um, we know that uh, we've got a, a marketing edge because we, we sell really good, high quality meat at our local farmers markets. People rush to get it. Um, we could, we, our, all our marketing costs are already thick, already done. Uh, so if we produce other things, then it's just cream on top, you know. So we're establishing Acacia Woodlands at the moment. Um, uh, this is a whole topic in itself, but we're planting some of those, at the moment it's those two paddocks there, uh, with specially selected species of acacias. Um, I've done this at home, at my place, for, just with a small number for about 20 years now, is that when the acacia drops its seed, most of them around Christmas time around here, um, they fall to the ground in all that mulch under a wall tree, and they sit there and sit there and sit there. Now, uh, we can produce nearly three tonnes of wattle seed a year on that little paddock there. Using five, no one star energy, nothing. And feed our chooks, which I do at home, on the wattle seed, on the insects that are living on the wattles and on the grass and stuff that's growing around it. So we can produce eggs for basically no, with a mobile chook pen, like who's familiar with Joel Salatin's, you know, Beverly Hillbillies type setup. Um, with a mobile chook pen wandering around these acacia woodlands, we can produce eggs for no input cost or five star energy. How many tonnes did you say? Oh, uh, three tonnes. We could get three tonnes of wattle seed. But when you look at the, the insects and the grass and all the other things that are there as well, it's, um, yeah. So we're mucking around with that a bit at the moment. And Bonnie and Clyde. Oh, and we're training a couple of marimas, yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Uh, Bonnie and Clyde Maremmas at the moment. We've got chooks out in those paddocks at the moment training two new Maremma pups to do the guards. You have another one? Hmm? Oh, I'm sorry, I was going to ask. Uh, any more slides? Yes, please. Um, no, that's it. You mentioned early on once about um, swales in reference to the olives. You didn't seem to talk about it again in reference to Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Uh, those olives, see this thicker red piece here? Um, on that, that's a laneway hard runoff surface on a slope and uh, so 
Uh, the water is running at right angles across the laneway off the hard runoff surface and gathering in the swale at the bottom of that runoff surface. So it's uh, effectively increasing our annual rainfall. We don't irrigate the olives, just effectively increasing the annual rainfall to those olives by catching the water off the hard runoff surface into the swale and then down the olives. Is that the only place you've used them or have you used them in the past? Or Not at the moment, no. Is it a plan to? Um, yeah, possibly. Possibly, yeah. <coughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, once we can, uh, there's uh, we've got other systems to work on first. And you've got to remember, this all has to be done by staff and students to working together as a class. So it, at least it takes time. Yeah. Mm. Can you use the olives as a what, the chicken? Is yeah, that? you could too. Yeah, at home, my chooks fly up into the trees to get the olives. So you you could for sure. Mm. One more question. One more question. There are other uses for wobble seeds. There are. Yeah, using yeah. developing that as a No. Uh, we're aware of it, uh, but uh, we know that we've got a really lucrative market for organic eggs at the farmer's market, uh, and, and our customers will pay for them. Uh, so that's what we're focusing on at the moment. Yeah. Oh, I know that might pretty well draw to a close. Uh, I'd like to, well, on behalf of these people, I'm sure they've enjoyed it, but I'd like to personally thank you for right. coming with us. I think you're with us tomorrow, aren't you? Yeah. So I've got to go through this again. Yeah, I know. You can go out the back tomorrow. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure, as you well know, mm -hmm. and it's gentlemen like this to give that outside uh, support to the organic industry and by doing this and it's self-sufficient and self-funding I think is absolutely brilliant. So I'd like you to put your hands together. I'll leave some cards up on the barrel here if anyone wants to contact me later. Is there a David Stagg here we've been looking for? Well, ladies and gentlemen, we've got the other half ready.